Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Adam from K6ARK Portable Radio. There was an interesting event in ham radio over the weekend where some local Southern California stations made contact over two meter simplex with a station in New Hampshire. How might that happen, you might ask? Let's take a look and see if we can figure it out. First things first, I want to introduce you to a YouTube channel called the SoCal Simplex Archive. This is a new channel set up by a guy named David, and he hooked up an SDR to a quarter wave vertical antenna at his home QTH there in San Pedro, uh, near the port of Long Beach, and he monitors 146.52 Simplex and streams the received audio and the waterfall to the internet over YouTube. So here's his YouTube page. You can see a little bit of, of an about description and a slew of videos here, morning, afternoon, and nighttime is typically how he breaks them up. And one of the cool things about this is that you can go back and listen to recordings Say if you were doing a soda activation and you want to hear how you sounded in the LA area while you were operating from a local SoCal summit. The other cool thing it does is that it gives us a way to look back on this odd event and try to figure out what happened. So let's take a listen. This occurred on Saturday, July 24th, uh, starting around 10.30 in the morning. Let's take a, a listen here of the first time that the New Hampshire station comes up on this local SDR receiver. QRZ, uh, NE1B, New Hampshire. So we hear QRZ, NE1B, November Echo 1, Bravo, New Hampshire. That's kind of odd and interesting to hear with a real strong signal in Southern California. So about five minutes later, we listen yeah, I'm again. Just trying to figure out how we're here in San Diego in New Hampshire. NE1B, November Echo 1 Bravo. So he's clearly a bit confused trying to figure out how he can hear San Diego, a San Diego station in New Hampshire. We can't hear the other station that he's talking to, but uh, presumably in San Diego. So he says S9 full quieting, little bit of fade from time to time, but uh, strong signal into New Hampshire. And he's asking if the other station's running a remote base or something of the sort. That's the obvious conclusion here. Other stations replying to him. So there you go, you, you hear any one b come back, you can't hear the other station, but presumably he tells him that he's not running a remote base because he's uh, saying that there must be some kind of ducting or something going on. You also don't really hear any latency or delays in these contacts that make it sound like it's going through a linked repeater, which is also a bit odd. But the signal strength is incredible. It's a very strong signal coming into this, uh, this receiver in Southern California. So let's take a look at NE1B's QRZ page and try to learn a little bit more about this operator. His name's Bill. He lives in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, Hudson, New Hampshire, according to QRZ here. And he's been a ham for quite a long time, since 1961 he, when he passed the novice exam. And if you scroll through his page here, you can see he's got quite a setup. Uh, some towers here with a log periodic and it appears uh, two meter and 70 centimeter horizontally polarized Yaggies. Um, if we scroll down toward the bottom of the page here, we can see uh, numerous DXCC awards and some other awards for various uh, contesting. So he, he's clearly a skilled, experienced operator that, that knows what he's doing and has a solid station. So 
perhaps it's possible that he was able to make this long distance contact to Southern California. Let's take a listen uh, about five minutes after that contact that Bill made with that San Diego station. So now we hear Whiskey 2 Charlie Alpha Zulu calling CQ Mobile. We don't know where he's mobile, but if we look, look up his QRZ page, his home QTH is in Bath, New York, about 300 miles west of Nashua, New Hampshire. So it, it's possible that he was mobile in Southern California. It's also possible that he was mobile near his home QTH or possibly mobile somewhere closer to NE1B if the presumption is that there was some kind of a linked repeater system going on or, or um, remote station system uh, going on, he may have been reaching that same remote station that NE1B may have been reaching if that was the case here. So what the heck happened? Was this natural propagation or was this a linked repeater? So starting around 1.15 local time, NE1B proceeded to make about 20 contacts with a bunch of local stations in Southern California. Let's listen to uh, maybe a couple of those here. This is November Echo 1 Bravo, NE1B in New Hampshire. So again, NE1B coming in strong and clear to the San Pedro receiver, putting his call sign out to see if anyone's monitoring. Oh, we heard the squelch pop there. Somebody might have been coming back. A kilo Echo 6, Zulu Golf Radio, November Echo 1, Bravo. Running 40 watts into a diamond vertical at 80 feet here in southern New Hampshire. My name is Bill. Unbelievable. Where are you located? Over. So we now know that Bill is running 40 watts to just an omnidirectional vertical antenna in, at 80 feet above ground level in Nashua, New Hampshire. So he's asking where the other station is. All right, uh, give me your call sign again. Mine is November Echo 1 Bravo. I want to write this down. This is a unique event. Definitely a unique event. So pretty wild. And if you listen to that recording for uh, the next 20 minutes or so, I'll put the link in the description below so you can check it out. You can hear him proceed to make contact with uh, a whole bunch of other stations in Southern California. Let's take a look at the map of where this receiver is, the San Pedro receiver. It's down here next to Long Beach Harbor. And if we zoom out a little bit, we can see uh, these red dots are all the other stations that anyone B made contact with over the next 30 minutes or so, which was really quite interesting. And if we look at the Google Map path from the San Pedro receiver out to Nashua, New Hampshire, it, uh, it goes across the entire United States, 2,579 miles and 4,150 kilometers. Quite a long distance. While you listen to those contacts with those other stations, you'll also note that you can't hear a number of those other stations. You can only hear maybe about a quarter of them. So my presumption based on that is that the, um, the SoCal Simplex uh, receiver, that receiver that, that we're listening to in the, these recordings, is not a, a particularly high gain or high level uh, antenna that, that picks up uh, weak signals from long distances. It's something that requires a pretty strong signal to be able to break the squelch and, and receive the, uh, the stations that are, or the signals that are coming in. The other thing that I notice about all of these stations is that they all have viewshed of the LA Basin area, which kind of makes me think that the source of any one B's transmissions in Southern California very well may have been through some sort of a linked repeater system that he simply didn't know he was going through that someone else had set up. So the other interesting thing we notice as we listen through these contacts is that we hear a couple of other stations come in 
that are in the high desert over the San Gabriel Mountains outside of the LA Basin that apparently can't hear NE1B, whereas all of the stations in the LA Basin or that have viewshed to the LA Basin can hear NE1B. That suggests to me the possibility of some sort of a linked repeater or remote station setup. But let's consider what types of propagation modes might actually allow this type of contact to happen. So as we looked at on the map, we've got a path of about 4,150 kilometers from the LA Basin to Nashua, New Hampshire. And if we look at the distance records from the ARRL for VHF, we have a list of sort of the common propagation modes that we can expect for two meter transmissions. And the most common and the most likely to occur over a path like that are going to be either tropospheric ducting or sporadic E. We didn't have any, uh, any aurora going on at the time, so aurora propagation is highly unlikely. And aurora propagation also has a very unique sound to it that uh, would have been likely much more obvious in, in these transmissions. So tropospheric ducting or sporadic E seem to be our most likely possible scenarios. Let's take a look at distance records for that frequency and those modes. So if we look at this distance record list and at the 144 megahertz sporadic E, the record for sporadic E was 3,635 kilometers, so about 500 kilometers short of what this propagation path would be if this were over sporadic E. Seems a little bit unlikely if that's the overall record, especially given that some of these contacts were made with low power, uh, with marginal antennas, and handheld radios. And if we look at tropospheric ducting, the longest contact over the continental U.S., uh, Tropo C here, is 2,715 kilometers, which again is much shorter than this path of 4,150 kilometers. Let's take a look real quick, though, at Hepburn charts, which are tropospheric condition prediction tools for Saturday July 24th, the date that these contacts occurred. This is a Hepburn chart for the southwestern U.S. on that date, and we can see that there is basically zero tropospheric ducting condition in the eastern part of Southern California, across Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, until you get out to the, the Midwest. And looking toward the eastern half of the country, there's some light tropospheric ducting conditions over the Midwest, uh, Kentucky region, but that's about it. So tropospheric ducting seems highly improbable for this. In addition to that, tropospheric ducting, not only does it require specific conditions, it also typically occurs at a lower level in the troposphere and between San Diego or Southern California, the LA Basin and New Hampshire, there are numerous mountain ranges up to 10,000 plus feet in elevation, which would likely prevent tropospheric ducting from working across those longer distances. So what about sporadic E? Well, one of the stations that made contact with Bill sent him an email and Bill sent over uh, some, some graphics that he had put together of sporadic E conditions at the time that these contacts were made. Looking at the sporadic E chart, we can see there's a pretty strong cloud of sporadic E over the Midwest, getting the maximum usable frequency up to 174 megahertz. That would potentially be high enough for a single skip in that part of the country, but sporadic E hops are typically not 4,000 plus kilometers, and it seems exceptionally unlikely that that single sporadic E cloud would be sufficient to provide propagation all the way across the US. So we looked at the distance records, we listened to some of the contacts, and there is one exchange in this entire recording that seems to kind of stand out as potentially having some digital packet loss. Let's take a listen to that 
and see if we can pick that out of this conversation. Okay, got it. PE6 Zulu Golf Romeo. Little psych on Southern California. This is November Echo 1 Bravo near Nashua, New Hampshire, Southern New Hampshire. Thanks for the contact. Uh, the highly unusual for today. 73. So on that transmission, you could definitely hear some digital distortion and some potential packet loss in there that sounded like that transmission was coming through some sort of a link. I, I really don't think that was on the receiving end through this SDR. It sounds to me like it was on the path between uh, the source and the, the transmitter on the far end. So take a listen to the link in the description below and listen through these contacts. See if you can pick out any other clues that might indicate whether this was natural propagation or if you think it may have been uh, some kind of internet linked or remote based type setup that these people making contact simply didn't know they were using. Put your feedback in the comments below. I'm curious what you think about this and perhaps we can solve this mystery together. 7-3 for now from Adam at K6ARK Portable Radio.